In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so mine was in Luke 17, 20 through 22. The Lord tells us that the kingdom of God is within us. How should we understand this and how ought we cultivate the inner kingdom of God? Well, I mean, the kingdom of God is within us because doesn't the Holy Spirit abide within a baptized person? Right? And so uh, the kingdom of God is not so much a place. It is a state of being. Salvation is to be changed and be perfected. That's, it's not just being forgiven or going to heaven. It is becoming heaven. It's becoming holy. Because if we're not holy, how can we be in the presence of holiness? It's just not possible without shame. Look what happened to Adam and Eve, right? I mean, they had an intimate relationship with God and then they sinned and they couldn't be in his presence without shame. So sin makes it impossible to be in the presence of God, not because God punishes, but because we can't be in his presence we, without, without being competent. I remember when I was a kid, I, uh, I broke, a, ba I broke a, a window with a baseball. We were in the backyard, and I was pitching to somebody. And my parents had told me, don't pitch, because I was left-handed, and still am, of course. And I was wild, you know. So I threw it wildly, and it broke a window, and we moved somewhere else. And I didn't tell my parents that whole day that the window was broken. And so at, at, at dinner, I was like kind of uncharacteristically quiet and everything. And of course, they, they'd already figured out that the window was broken. And then once I admitted that the window was broken, it was like, well, you know, just don't do that again. Don't, don't throw in the backyard, et cetera. But I couldn't be easily in their presence when I had that, that sin, shall we say, right? So we are, the kingdom of heaven is to become holy and to become good, to have, have holiness in our heart, to have perfection. So it certainly is within us because life is lived in the heart. It's not lived anywhere else. It's lived in the heart. So that's what it means by the kingdom of heaven within you. And so how do you, pro how do you cultivate that? Well, you know, one of my favorite answers, I love frustrations. and prostrations, right? Love and prostrations, ascetical life. And ascetical life is denying yourself, taking up the cross and following, following the Lord. So that's, that's how you cultivate it. I, I can't imagine that we could cultivate it by uh, without reading the scriptures, without reading the Psalter. Uh, you know, many of you are students. If you're a student in, I don't know, uh, let's say American history. If you don't read American history books, why are, you, why are you studying American history? Or if you don't read, if you don't love mathematics, why are you studying mathematics, right? I mean, you should love those sorts of things. And... Uh, so if we love God, uh, we would want to learn of him by reading the scriptures, reading the lives of saints, all those things. But not like they're a grocery list, like you have to go through those things and do them. It's just it's natural that you want to do it. So cultivating the kingdom of heaven within you is living with love fa fa to fulfill the great commandment, which, by the way, is not in the Ten Commandments, right? Neither is the second, which is like it. And if we do that, we become like God. We're made in his image. We're to become like him. That's all done in the heart. Nothing external whatsoever. So, there you go. Yes, sir. Okay, so, um, the, the old law is oftentimes disregarded uh, in orthodoxy, like specific things about, um, like, remaining kosher mm -hmm. are, um, uh, and, you know, not wearing mixed fabrics and those types of things. Um, and I... I was reading the gospel according to Matthew and Matthew 17 through 19. Uh, maybe have questions about that. Can I, can I just read the passage to you? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill. Amen. I tell you until, I, until heaven and earth pass away, not even one smallest letter or one tiny pin stroke shall in any way pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Um, he goes on to say, whoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach others to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall do and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So he's he, he uses specific wording, like like not a, not a single mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not a single thing should fall away. So yeah, how do we how do we reconcile? That? Well, first of all, the Jewish law is not abrogated. 
it's fulfilled by Christian law. What is that? What is abrogated? Um, like set aside. Right. Okay. It, it was a teacher. The, the law was a schoolmaster. St. Saint, Saint Paul says that. So the law was a schoolmaster to teach us right and wrong. People didn't know right and wrong. So we were taught what's right and wrong. It's wrong to steal. It's wrong to commit adultery. It's wrong to covet. It's wrong to lie, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the law, uh, with the exception of the the fifth commandment, they're all about don't do this, right? The fifth commandment is honor your father and mother. That's the only positive, if you want to say, positive commandment. And of course, then we have the two great commandments, which are extremely positive. I'm not talking about. You know, I'm talking about that they're saying do something instead of don't do something. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So the Jewish law was not put aside. It was fulfilled. And just as when we are children, we have things that we're told, but then then we have a better understanding. And then that passes to another, a firmer grip of reality, shall we say, right? So it's to give a... An example, let's say, when a child says, where did I come from? You came from mommy's tummy, right? That's true, right? But it's not very accurate in terms of, you know, then you learn about gestation and blah, blah, blah. Then you learn a whole lot more about where you came from, right? And how you how you came and how you were conceived and stuff. But that doesn't make the comment that you make to the child false. It just makes it outdated, it's no longer necessary. So the need to not eat shellfish and um, et cetera, et cetera. Those were to teach a, a people that was just barely past being pagan. They were in a pagan society and pagan society was very unruly and very uh, cruel, very sexually immoral, all the rest. The Jews were taught to live with a morality that was completely different than the world. Now, it wasn't good enough yet, Christian morality is better, but it was a progression. So we don't need to not eat shellfish, etc., because the Christian law is, is a higher understanding, but it's not abrogating the law. Now, there are things in the law that are not ignored at all, right? I mean, if it says, do not murder, we still don't murder, right? Do not commit adultery. Those are, those are Old Testament laws that are still true. But then there are dietary laws and washing laws and things like that, which are no longer necessary. We don't need to wash. We've been washed by baptism. All the other washings are unnecessary now, right? Well, would you say that the uh, Old Covenant talking about kosher diet and things was a precursor to Christian fasting? Teaching people how to... Yes, for sure, for sure, yeah. Teaching people that you eat, uh, everything is subject to God, right? So we need to eat to live, for sure, but we also subject that to God, to God's providence. Yes, it was like a precursor for Christian fasting. Also, there was, when they were on the mountain, a man wasn't supposed to come to his wife, right? And they even, they would say you'd be put to death if you did it. So we have that idea now, <laughs> certainly not putting to death. Excuse me. But before we take the Holy Mysteries, the night before, we do not have marital relations, things like that. So, yes, all those things are precursors to the more perfect form of fasting. But they see they fasted because they needed to be, you know, forgiven. We're not fasting to be forgiven. We're fasting to be purified. And when you fast, you, you're just more spiritually intelligent. It's just, it just a fact. Anybody who does it knows that's, that, that's the case, right? Anybody who knows who is married and has continence in marriage and chastity in marriage, and perhaps maybe they didn't before, they know how much better it is, right? Also, the Jewish conception was you got to do this or you're going to be killed a lot of times. And the Christian is we do these things because they're, they're part of the road to perfection. Not because they're ordered as a legal requirement. Excuse me. So, two specific political laws that are, um, I don't want to say done away with, but not practiced. Um, is one is like not wearing uh, shirts of mixed fabric. 
and um, another is uh, not sowing um, the same, same like two to the same seed within a field, uh, for example, uh, or that might I might be is that, is that a law? I'm not an expert. Two separate two separate seeds, like two two separate seeds in the same field. You're not supposed to. I don't remember that, but I'll I'll take your word for it. I, you know, okay. I, I've read it, but I don't remember. But I know about the mixed fabric and the mixed fabric. I, I don't really understand exactly what the meaning. I'm sure I could find something from the fathers, but um, I'm too. I'm so busy reading the gospels and the and the Psalter and everything else that I, I I'm not an expert about that. But in general, those laws were to give order to the Jews, to, to a, a, an orderly way of approaching God and a, 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 a semi-personal way, not a completely personal way of approaching God. It's there, the glimmers of that are in the Old Testament. But to the average Jew, I'm sure it was that God was this all-consuming fire and you had other people, the professionals, the Levites, approach God and they were terrified and they needed to do certain things like bring two turtle doves or a lamb at various times. They didn't really have a full understanding of what was happening. And of course, the lamb is a type of Christ. So we don't need to sacrifice animals anymore. There has been a sacrifice, right? Christ sacrificed himself for our sake. So there is no need for sacrifice anymore. All that stuff is valid for then, but now it's been come up to a different level right and there's also the fact of the matter that a lot of those laws were instantiated for the purpose of setting the jews apart from the pagan society they were in and then on top of that those laws were not addressed to gentiles and when the apostles met for the apostolic council in jerusalem in acts 15 it they prescribe a short list, which is the same list that Gentiles were required to follow when they sojourned amongst the Jews, which is don't fornicate, don't eat blood, and don't eat food sacrificed to idols. If I could say, also Christ kept the law perfectly in his life, uh, the circumcision being presented to the temple, keeping the Sabbath through his death when he slept on, the, on that day. And so there's part also the, um, the reality, again, we talked about, about when you're united to Christ, that you are part of his body, and he kept the law fully, so in him it is kept. Interesting. Okay. Okay. That, that answers. But one of the things that in our day now, because, you know, we have the remote coalition, uh, we have people that are saying, oh, it says not to eat shrimp, but everybody eat shrimp, and he says certain things about sexuality, well, that can't be valid because we eat shrimp. There are moral laws and there are dietary laws and, and ritual laws. There's a big difference. There's no need for the ritual of circumcision anymore because baptism is, has, is, the, is the reality that's pointed to by circumcision. There's no need for circumcision religiously anymore. So we don't, as a rule, we don't require circumcision. We're, I don't care if somebody gets circumcised. Because it's not a, of a religious circumstance, uh, religious uh, anymore. It matters in some places. In Egypt, a person who's a Christian is not going to get circumcised because they don't want to look like a Muslim, right? So it matters in some places of the world, but like in America, it's not such a, it's not it's not considered such a big deal, you know. I once heard it explained that we had so many Jewish doctors that circumcision went everywhere. And that might be true. I don't know. I don't know. I took a uh, philosophy of art class this last semester. And if you're going to take a philosophy class, the first person you're probably going to talk about is Plato, rightfully so. Um, and something that I noticed in, and this, this isn't just from this semester, but in reading Plato during my life, is um, how him, and of course Socrates, written through him, how closely aligned most of what he says is to Christianity today. Like he was a moralist, he was a mono, he was monotheistic, um, and a lot of these things. And even St. Justin Martyr even writes that he calls Plato and Socrates divine. Um, and so, uh, and I'm sure you've heard of the book, uh, Christ the Eternal Tao, which is about Lao Tzu, um, which is also fascinating, kind of the, the comparison of what he was writing about the Tao and what we believe about the word. And so I was just wondering, like, have you ever explored 
any sort of that pre-Christian philosophy and kind of felt the same thing of this similarity like St. Justin Martyr did? Not a lot. I did take a, a philosophy of religion course way back when, and um, we studied Hinduism and Buddhism and et cetera. Uh, Hinduism was just downright scary. It just seemed like they were just worshiping the devil flat out, you know. Um, Buddhism, if you read some Buddhist scriptures, they they read very much like Proverbs, like the Proverbs. So I was struck by some of those similarities. But I've never really, you know, I'm not, that's not my, I'm not really inclined that way to to do those kinds of studies. You know, I'm kind of a simple guy, but, um, and I just, I just don't have time to to do it. But I think that definitely there are fathers that would talk about the, the, the Greek pagan philosophers uh, and told how they were in, in many ways a precursor to Christian thought. For sure, for sure. But, you know, I mean, if, if you know such things, God bless you. I just, you know, it's not, I haven't read much of Plato, you know. I recommend it. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, in an, in another life, you know, you know, if I get reincarnated, I'll <laughs> but I just can't. Cool, I mean, there's too much. I mean, just reading St. Isaac the Syrian is, you know, if I'm lucky, I get to read, you know, two hours in a day. That's a really lucky day. All the other, I mean, I'm reading the, 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 four or five books in the New Testament, four or five books in the Old Testament. That's the way I do it. I just read a bunch of them and all at once. And uh, and the lives of the saints, Psalter, St. Isaac the Syrian, a couple things. I mean, that's it. I mean, I, Plato is, you know, on my, on my list of 20 things, he's number 28. <laughs> you know, so he's good to read, but. If you have time. That's if you what, have that's time, you, you know, if you have time. I mean, some people have, I'm sure there are some people that have come to Christianity through reading Plato. I'm, I have no doubt about that. Or reading uh, some of the Chinese philosophers, et cetera, I'm sure. Father Zara from Rose was a student of Eastern. Yeah, he was. He yeah, and he knew Mandarin and probably another dialect of uh, Chinese perfectly. He spoke it fluently. Yeah, so, I mean, great. I mean, people find... The truth through all kinds of things. I mean, there's truth in the Buddhist scriptures. There's no doubt about it. There might even be some truth in the Hindu scriptures. I'm not sure. They, they were scary to me. I, they were weird. They were weird. And um, I didn't like them, you know. But, I mean, there's truth in everything. There's just not full truth except in the church. Broken clock is right twice a day. Yeah, you know, except in the digital age when it's just not right at all. It doesn't even turn on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> See that that the adage we can't use that adage anymore, can we? Not easily. You have to teach kids how to read analog clocks before you can make a joke. Yeah. And keep analog clocks alive by the saying. Yeah, if you have fun, like you know, with a group of kids that all have phones, and when you talk about, you know, we used to have a phone, you know, we used to have a landline, and you know, when you called, you, you couldn't even leave a message because if nobody was home, it just kept ringing, and they look at you like what? Like you have horns coming out of your head or something? They're different. Yeah, I've had it. And it was really nice to call somebody. They didn't answer the phone, and you didn't immediately think they might be dead. You know? It's just like we'll get in touch with them eventually. So, all right, what other questions, comments? I heard you had a bunch. I <laughs> <laughs> wonder where that's coming from. Yeah, a certain troublemaker told me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do have questions. Uh, I guess one is about Mary uh -huh. and who it, I've heard that, of course, she was the mother of our Lord, mm -hmm. but was she perfect? Was she sinless? Well, you know, that's an interesting question, and I will uh, be like a politician Mm -hmm. And not really answer it. Mm -hmm. um, there are holy fathers that would answer it emphatically. She did never sin. I and there are holy fathers that say, well, you know, she had some imperfections. And I would say I don't really want to talk about Zacharias in that way. Uh, I do know that she was uh, a, a virgin. Uh, we know that. Uh, we also know dogmatically she was a virgin before, during, and after birth. So she's a virgin, not only in that she was a virgin when, when Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
but the birth was miraculous. And the and she, of course, did not bear children afterwards. She and Joseph did not have relations. That's why we have this idea of the Josephite marriage, you know. And the reason why was he was there to protect her. We know from history, uh, from our tradition, he was 85 years old when, when he was chosen to uh, protect her. She wanted to be a virgin and she had lived in the temple. Uh, we know this from our tradition and, and uh, that it was very rare for a person to be a virgin. It wasn't unknown. I mean, Elias, Elijah was a virgin. Mm -hmm. So, but it was very uncommon. And the, the high priest had, uh, the priests and the ruling council had all agreed that she could be a virgin because while well, she lived in a temple, I mean, it's very, uh, very different. And so when she reached of age, when she would, go, you know, go through puberty, they would, they moved her out and had her, because, uh, you know, you couldn't bleed in the precincts of the temple. It was, it was forbidden. So uh, she was in a house. And of course, then the, 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 the angel came and we have the Annunciation. So we know that she's the virgin before, during, and after childbirth. We also know that she was uh, um, an obedient handmaid of the Lord. Or really an obedient slave of the Lord is the proper word. Uh, sometimes we don't like that word slave because of some of the other uh, implications. Of How do we know that she lived in the temple? By our tradition, we, we, we know it through. There's a book called Proten Evangelium of St. James. Proto Evangelium. Yes. Yeah. And parts of that book are, are not true, but other parts the church has always believed are true, which is part of our tradition. See, remember that the Lord. He taught the disciples and apostles 40 days after he was risen. We only have recorded of a little tiny bit and really almost none of his teaching. We have recorded that he did teaching on the road to Emmaus, probably, probably six, eight hour walk, but we don't know what it was. But he opened to them all the scriptures concerning himself. So all those prophecies and many prophecies that are not readily apparent, like we believe that the the uncut mountain that Habakkuk saw, that's the uncored mountain. That is a, an image of the Theotokos, a virgin who gave birth. Now, you can't just read that and say, oh, sure, that's the Theotokos. But we know it from our tradition that that is a reference to the Theotokos being virgin. You know, and also the unburnt bush, right? The bush that's burning but not burning because it was the light of God. It was the, the divine light of God that looked like fire. And so the mother of God, she bore God and didn't burn up. How in the world can a mortal have God within her and not burn up? And we call her, by the way, not mother of our Lord. That's true, but it's much more emphatic to say mother of God. Because there was a problem in the ancient times of a heresy to say that Mary gave birth to Christ, the man, and then somehow that man was imbued with divine characteristics. Well, that's not true. She gave birth to God and God becoming man. So now Jesus Christ is God and man, perfectly God and man in the same body, in the same person. One person, two natures, two wills, two natures. So we call her mother of God, which sounds very, you know, just inflammatory to some people. But she... That's a, that was defended for, in the 4th century, in the 5th century, extremely. So she's the mother of God. And we know these things about her through our holy tradition. The St. Paul said, you know, do the things that I've, I've told you, whether by word or by letter. And the vast majority of everything that was learned was by word. We didn't have a, a, a New Testament until the end of the 4th century. We didn't have a canon. Incredibly un untrusted at that time because you could write anything down and people would go, oh, well, it's a right. book. So it took time. And not only that, but even if we had the New Testament and we knew there was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then John certainly had access to those things. And that's why his gospel is so different because he read and said, okay, you guys have covered this stuff. I'm going to know, talk about the person of Christ because his gospel is really a revelation of who Jesus Christ is more than the other ones. And he doesn't care about history as much. In fact, he kind of 
goes back and forth. His, if you use John for a chronology, you get very confused. He wasn't trying to be a chronology. He wasn't trying to write a history book that was A to Z. You know, the ancients were not concerned about that. What right? was the Johannian literature in that point? In that, all of the books that John writes are not chronologically in a, in a line. They're right. They're you know. But but he was so. They're more about who Jesus was. They they were they were the revelation of Jesus Christ, God and man, and what Jesus thought about himself and preached about himself, and you know nowhere else is that except in John, right? But the the Gospels were probably, probably no church had all four. They would have one, or they'd have a fragment of a letter, or they had this and that. And yet the faith was being proclaimed, and it was the same throughout. And these things were all believed. The mother of God was a mentor to the apostles. And... She was among the, you know, the, um, what's the word, um, the the retinue that came around with Christ. All the women came around with him. She was among those. She traveled with him everywhere. She grew up with him, right? Or he grew up with her. So he, she knew things about him that nobody else knew. And then she communicated some of those things to Luke, for instance. Why do we have the infancy narratives? Because she told him. He wasn't there for those narratives. So all those things are explained to Luke and then he writes them down. And there's so many other things that the mother of God did that, that are just part of our tradition. And we don't have a word she wrote. There's not one verified word that has been saved that the mother of God wrote. And yet she was so influential and the church had veneration for her from the beginning. There is a second century hymn that we still sing in the church to the Theotokos. Second century hymn. That's before, you know, Martin Luther was the gleam and 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 the gleam of his granddaddy's eyes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there was no ambiguity. There was no uh, nobody was disagreeing about anything. People venerated the mother of God. Because she bore our Lord Jesus Christ. And all three of the main reformers also did. Yeah, yeah, they did. And uh, it, it's so widely known that ancient Christianity uh, venerated the mother of God so much that pagan historians uh, to uh, about Christians are like, for, for some reason, because obviously women weren't venerated in any sense, right. uh, the, these crazy, crazy people trying to, you know, worship this woman, you know, they obviously they put it in a negative light, but it was, it was so commonly held among Christianity that that was one of the things that uh, pagan people made fun of Christians for. It's like, oh, you're a woman worshiper. And, you know, there was actually a pagan polemicist that also used her being, you know, the mother of our Lord and the mother of God as a detraction against Christianity because they're like, well, if he's some great king and she's a common woman, how is a common woman the mother of a king? Well, read the genealogy. There are a lot of common people. There are a lot of, there were, you know, two prostitutes in there, and well, one prostitute and one that acted like one, right? And uh, all, all the rest, right? I mean, there was a pagan woman and there was a, uh, you know, the four women are very interesting that are mentioned in the genealogy. I mean, Judah, uh, Ju the priesthood changed with Jesus. So the line of the priesthood changed to Judah because Jesus was going to be of that line. And the first child born of the line of Judah was born out of fornication with his daughter-in-law, who was pretending to be a prostitute. She was Tamar. And she, Judah, the first two children died, and Judah says, yeah, you can marry this my my younger son, but he's too young, so wait. And then he gets old enough, and Judah's like, oh, I don't want him to die too. No, you can't marry him. Now she's stuck, so what does she do? She dresses up as a prostitute, and I actually, to me, I think it's a little comical. He didn't know it was her. Well, why? Because they must have been veiled, you know? I mean, <laughs> otherwise he would have known, right? So, and he procures her services, 
one of our one of the fathers, you know, and then she she gets his ring and his staff as surety, right? Then she gets to have a baby bump, and he's like, "Well, you know, you've obviously fornicated. You should be put to death." And she's like, "Well, let me show you something here, right?" So I mean, he's the beginning of the line, if you want to say you can start. Uh, you know, certainly Judah is descended from all these other people too, but Judah, <laughs> he, he didn't do the, he didn't do right, did he? Right? I mean, there's a whole lot of that in the genealogy to show that Jesus Christ saves all of mankind, all of their sins. I mean, you've got paganism, you've got fornication, you've got murder, uh, you've got all kind of stuff in the genealogy, in in those ancestors that Jesus is not ashamed to call his ancestors or his progenitors, right? I guess it's not, they're his ancestors. I always get that messed up. So as far as the mother of God, there- So she did. So she didn't have relations with Joseph? No. How did he have brothers? He had brothers because the, the word for brother is uh, even in Arabic to this day, uh, and certain Semitic languages is an ambiguous word which could mean brother or cousin. And I'm told, I don't know Arabic, but I'm told that the, the best way to refer to your brother by blood is the my brother who was born of the same mother and father. Mm -hmm. Right? That's unambiguous. Now, it's no doubt that you're blood brothers, right? Having the same mother and the same father. So his brothers and his sisters, of which we know of a few, we know there was Judah, we know there was um, uh, James, Simeon, uh, uh, the sons of Zebedee were born of, um, uh, what, was his, what was her name? Salome. Salome. And there's another one that I don't remember. So I think we know, we know two women and three men that were sons and daughters of Joseph from a previous marriage. He was 85 years old. His wife died, most likely in childbirth or from disease or whatever else. So he had those children. He was 85 when Jesus was born? Yes, 85. And we know that through? Through our tradition, yeah. Tradition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know, it's not like you have to believe that, you, that you, Joseph was 85 or else you can't be an Orthodox Christian. But it seems to me very much that that if the church has always taught it, it we should just I, I just with humility just believe it. I don't question it. It's not a it's it's not an issue for me at all. We've always believed that Jesus that Jonas Joseph was eighty five, and you know if somebody says it couldn't be that he's eighty five. You know, okay, go ahead and don't believe it. But other things, we, obviously, we we have to believe and. Where is it? You know, what's the red thread of the tapestry you're going to take out until you no longer have a tapestry? So I, I just believe it all. Because that's actually the way I became an Orthodox Christian or part of the process. I was a Protestant. I was preaching on the beaches to people. I was trying to get them saved. I was doing all that and going into student union, you know, and sitting down next to somebody and we were supposed to almost like we were selling a magazine. We had to kind of talk to them and then and then and I hated that because it was all merchandising it was all marketing <laughs> and I hated it I hated it but I did it uh, and then um, I was I was dissatisfied because the only thing that we could agree on as we as it was a Protestant group called Campus Crusade for Christ they're not so big anymore but they were huge when I was in college and the only thing we could really agree on was we believe in Jesus we love Jesus and Jesus died for our sins we agree about that. We couldn't really. We never talked about Jesus, God, and man. Yeah, okay. God and man, I guess. What do you mean by that? I don't know. He's he, he's our Savior. Uh, born of a virgin, we believe that because it was right in the scriptures. Uh, is Mary ever virgin? Is baptism necessary? Is the Eucharist necessary? Does the Eucharist even exist? Is there a priesthood? All those things. Well, no, no, we don't believe in that stuff. Oh, yeah, you believe it. It's okay. You can believe in that kind of stuff. But we all believe in Jesus. So everything was was just believing in Jesus. And I thought, we don't even know who, who Jesus is. Because we won't even really define him, except he's the one who died on the cross for our sins. And the church was very careful to define who Jesus is. 
very, very careful. I mean, there are a lot of people that died because of this. And, and what about icons? Oh, icons are idolatry. Well, okay, you do icons, and I, you know, I sing songs with you, and we go on the beaches and preach together. So I guess they're okay, but they're not my thing. But we all believe in Jesus, and I just, I, I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand it. I mean, I was a, uh, uh, a chemistry student. I mean, you know, you can't just say you take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and maybe you'll get a reaction to work. You know, that's how you blow up chemistry labs, right? So you, you there's exactitude in science. And there's exactitude in Christianity. I mean, God is who he is. And Jesus is who he is. We better talk about how he is, not how he isn't. So I was very dissatisfied, and I latched on to our Lord's promise. I will send you the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, who will lead you into all truth. Thinking, where's the all truth? I mean, one person says, it's just a symbol. We don't have, we have the Lord's Supper once a month. And it's and it's crackers, and we don't believe in drinking uh, alcohol, so it's it's grape juice. And other people are saying we have the Lord's Supper every single Sunday, etc. Right? It reminds me of a joke. You know how you tell the difference between a Baptist and a Methodist? The Methodists will say hi to you in the liquor store. That's it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. So, yeah, yeah. And then the other one is how do you if you go fishing? Uh, why do you always bring two Baptists with you and not just one? Because if you want to bring one, he'll drink all your beer. <laughs> uh -huh. So, so anyway, um, I'm notorious for these jokes. I'm sorry. You're just going to have to put up with them. So, so we have this understanding from our holy tradition. It just, it just permeates into us. And uh, it's just so remarkable not to have to decide things. You know, it's all done. I, I, I'm looking for the truth, and I'm thinking, okay, the Holy Spirit leads us in their own truth. It's got to be true. It's right in the Bible. It's true. Well, if it's true, then, and the gates of hell do not prevail against the church, then there must be a church. And the but church all these, is the pillar and ground of that truth. And the pillar of church is the pillar and ground. And the church must be visible. This invisible stuff, everybody's got an invisible church and they believe everything that every Tom, Dick, and Harry believes. It's, it can't all be true. If you don't believe the Eucharist is true and somebody else does believe it's true, either both of you are wrong or one of you is wrong. You can't both be right. It's impossible to both be right. So what did the church teach? Well, now, if I'm evaluating what did the church teach, I might say, I like that doctrine, and I like that one, that one. Okay, that makes me a Methodist. I like this one and this one and this one. That makes me whatever. That's not true. I can't evaluate the truth based upon what are my favorite doctrines. I have to say, where is the church? Does the church exist? And there is absolute historical evidence for the church. And I'm thinking, I was raised Roman Catholic, so I'm going to go back and evaluate them first. Anybody's Roman Catholic, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but they changed all, all kind of stuff. I mean, they, they have actually literally have this idea of um, development of doctrine. That's right in their, in their theology that doctrine develops. We don't have developing doctrine. Doctrine is. Dogma is. That's why the creed cannot be changed. It was forbidden to be changed. And they went and changed it because they thought that they could. And a bunch of other stuff. So they can't be them because they changed from what was apostolic. Well, it can't be all the other guys because they changed from the ones who changed, right? I mean, I literally once saw um, uh, an advertisement for a Baptist church in Princeton, and I think they said Apostolic Baptist Church, and um, so they thought that they were preaching and teaching according to the apostles, and they made a point to say, only King James Bible. <laughs> I mean, the way God wrote it, you know? God wrote the King James Bible and gave it to us, you know? It's godly pen. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's a nice translation, but, you know, I, but the thing is that there was an amazing amount of controversy when it was when it was published. It, it took a long time to be accepted. So there were a lot of people that thought this is heresy to be this Bible. And of course, it's it's relatively good. There's there's ones that I prefer. But anyway, King James had it published to get the Catholics and the process to stop killing each other. Did it succeed? Probably, More or less. Probably, probably not too much, but a little bit. A little bit. So uh, 
I came, I found the church and it was really kind of miraculous how it happened. I'm like wondering, where is the church? I've got to find it. And I meet my wife at Campus Crusade from Christ meetings because she had been raised, not raised, she had been baptized as an Orthodox uh, by a saint, St. Aphilokios on, on Potmos in 1960. But she, she hadn't been raised Orthodox. Her father was irreligious for like 12 years. And then she starts going to a revival with a friend at a Wesleyan Methodist church. And he's like, oh, no, we're going to go back to the church because she did, you know, he didn't want her to go just there. All of a sudden, now they're going to Orthodox Church, but they're also mixing it in with everything else. It's just very, uh, you know, just a potpourri of stuff. And so she uh, really was Orthodox only in that she made the sign of the cross. She knew how to do that. And she had lamb on Pascha. That was it. I mean, that was it. They didn't know anything else. Church fathers or whatever, she didn't know anything else. Everybody is a Christian. So she's with a bunch of Protestants and I'm where there. And, you know, so we, you know, start dating and I'm going, I want to go to your church because we're going to all these campus ministry churches where they're putting their hands in the air and playing the Doobie Brothers. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. They were playing the Doobie Brothers in church. Yeah. Jesus is just all right with me. Jesus is just all right. Oh, yeah. They're playing that. That was their hymn. I mean, can you believe this? They're playing the Doobie Brothers. And, and I mean, that's a great song. I mean, it's a great song. But it's just, you know. He's all right. But then, but then it's all, you know, to say Jesus is just all right. He's my friend. Well, he called me friend. But I, I, I'm going to be careful about calling him friend until I'm a little bit better. And it reminds me of a sign I once saw when I was in some of my prison ministry journeys. You know, how these churches often have a funny saying outside. Said is if God is your co-pilot, you should change seats, because <laughs> that was an old old book. You know, he's not my co-pilot; he's my pilot. He's my captain, right? So uh, I go I I go to her church in Indianapolis, and it's just a vesper service, not somewhat similar to what we did a little bit. And uh, and the first thing they do basically is they have a litany, and a litany is basically responsorial. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace from above and the salvation of our souls. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lots of Lord, have mercies. The only time I heard Lord, have mercy was if I was listening to the blues. That was it. There was no Lord, have mercy in, in, in Campus Crusade for Christ meetings. We had mercy. We deserved to die. Jesus died in our place. We got mercy. Let's go out to the student union and get people saved. So there wasn't an idea that we needed mercy. I'm a 20, 20 year old kid. I'm thinking I need mercy. I'd like to not be so mad, you know. I'd like to. I'd like to not be so lazy, you know. I got things that are wrong with me. There's no real idea of 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 that kind of personal growth. It was like the idea of prayer was to have a quiet time with your Bible, and not really to do prostrations before the Lord. They they wouldn't understand any of that stuff, you know. That that, that all seemed Old Testament, you know, to them. And, you know, we weren't Old Testament, we were New Testament. And they also were very proud of themselves. They were good people. I love them dearly. But there was it's all about, I'm not religious. I have a relationship with Jesus. Well, I'm religious. I'm not afraid to be religious. God has dealt with man through religion. He started with the, with the Jews. That was a religion. Christianity is a religion. Now, it's a religion that is true and good and holy and personal and corporate. So it's not a dirty word to be religious. Now, religiosity is a dirty word, right? So I'm religious, period. And so I learned about the church from, I started learning about it from there. And I'm asking Marina questions. She doesn't know anything. She doesn't, can't answer any questions. And then I would drive her crazy. I started um, loving the Psalter, you know, I learned about the Psalter. So I would take my Bible, my New American Standard Bible, and we would go to Horticultural Park, which was, you know, a beautiful park in West Lafayette and in, 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 at Purdue University. And we would be with a roommate, Angie, who became a nun. And I, we would be walking and I would be reading the Psalter aloud. And Marina would be, be quiet, people hear you and stuff, you know, and I'd be reading it aloud. Angie loved it. I loved it. Marina's like, I don't. And uh, that was... Uh, that was uh, those were the days. The nineteen uh, I was baptized in nineteen eighty, 
So I found the church by by prayer and by uh, being exposed to it through Marina. And then, you know, I studied it and I read mostly I I, uh, I learned through the prayer through the prayer book. And especially the prayers of the Theotokos, because I've been raised Roman Catholic and I couldn't stand the way they related to the Theotokos. It's just weird. And um, and I didn't like it. I still don't like it. And so I was prejudiced against prayers of the Theotokos. I mean, when I heard Theotokos, Holy Theotokos, save us, I'm thinking, this is insane. Only God saves us. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yes, God <laughs> does save us. However, the, through the Theotokos, we are saved because the Theotokos is the instrument by which God came down from heaven. He's the, she's the ladder by which God came down to heaven, from heaven to earth. So she's part of our salvation. Now, she's not our savior, but she is absolutely a pivotal pro part of the process. And so when we say Most Holy Theotokos, save us, we're just being hyperbolic, just like the Byzantines, just like the Hebrews were, and saying sort of like up upping it a little bit. Basically, we're saying Most Holy Theotokos, pray for us because the saints pray for us. The effective and fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So says James. St. Peter said, I will, I will endeavor after I have left this tabernacle to keep you in remembrance of these things. Was he deluded? After he would leave this tabernacle, after he's going to be killed, I will endeavor that you will be in remembrance of these things. He knew that he was going to be alive and that he could still pray for them. Right? This is just part and parlance of, of Christian life back then. We knew these things were true. So, when we say Most Holy Theotokos save us, all of us know what that means. It doesn't mean that she's our savior, but it does mean that she is the most important mortal human being to ever live. And the holiest mortal human being to ever live, right? Only human. Jesus Christ is God and man. She was only man, only a human being. She was subject to death. She died. The Romans say she didn't, but she died. She died. And then the Lord brought her body and soul up to heaven. And it was revealed by a vision when St. Thomas came to see her because they all loved her. They all wanted to embrace her before her death. St. Thomas, he was always late. He'd be late to his own funeral. <laughs> and so he was late. And he came on the third day and he wanted to see her. So they opened up the tomb. She's gone. And then they go, what's going on? And then they have a, a vision, I think right immediately, right then and there. And the vision was that the, the Lord had taken the Theotokos up, body and soul. So she's the only mortal human being in heaven, body and soul. I mean, Jesus Christ is. We don't really know Elias and Enoch. We don't really know their condition, right? I mean, they didn't die on the earth. We don't really know exactly what their state is as far as having body or not. We don't really understand that. But the Theotokos is a perfected human being, like we're, like we're going to be. So not only is Jesus perfected, but a regular old human being. And that's all she was. She was a regular old human being with human nature and with the propensity to die and with the inability to be with God, except with God kind of reaching to her, right? And just like us. Now, what she did with her human stuff is way better than us. But still, she just had human stuff. And she now is in heaven in, the, in a perfect state. So she's yet another prophecy, just like Christ ascended into heaven and showed that we're going to go to heaven in that way. We're going to be body and soul in heaven. Well, okay, but he's still Jesus Christ. He's still, you know, something way better than we are. Now, the Theotokos, in terms of her stuff, is not better than us at all. She's identical to us, right? In terms of being so a human being. She's not sinless. Well, I'm, I'm not I'm not answering that question. Okay. But as far as being a human being, she's like us, right? I mean, Jesus Christ is like us, but also unlike us. Theotokos was completely like us. I think it would be a good time to explain how original sin works. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, original sin, original sin is really, we would call it ancestral sin. So obviously, Adam and Eve sinned, right? Serpent comes and tells Eve a truth, a partial truth, a half truth. You'll know good and evil. Yeah, you will. 
and you're not ready to know it, but I'm not going to tell you that part. So they, she, because of her pride, she disobeys God, eats of the fruit, and then her eyes are opened. And then she gives it to her husband, who is probably pretty much standing there. We're not positive, but she gives it to her husband and he takes it. Now their eyes are open and now they're terrified of God because they know about good and evil now, you know, but they weren't ready for it. Like a child, not ready for a traumatic event, right? Uh, they're not ready to assimilate things that we as adults have enough trouble assimilating. So then they, they cover themselves with, uh, with leaves and God's walking in the garden and they're afraid of him and they hide and all that transpires. And he says, why, who told you that you were naked? And then they have an opportunity to come clean, but they don't do it. And then, then they're going to be in this state forever because God doesn't go back on his word. We're eternal. So they made a choice. God's not going to like unmake the choice, like some sort of like magic. They made the choice, but now they're, they're eternal beings, they're eternal creatures, and they're going to be eternally estranged from God. What a terrible thing. So right then and there, the prophecy is made that the that serpent was going to is going to bite at your heel and you're going to crush its head. And that is the first prophecy of the incarnation. From Eve would come forth eventually Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was going to crush the serpent's head. And now we will be, we're still eternal creatures. We haven't stopped being eternal creatures. Everybody's an eternal creature. But we could be eternally alive or eternally dead, right? Eternally estranged from God, afraid of him, gnashing teeth, have the, the worm that, is, that does not die and all those terrible things. And, or we could be with God in a, in a beautiful way, like is described in the fourth chapter of Thessalonians. And other places. So that's why God became man to not to make us eternal. He already made us eternal. He doesn't go back on his word. But for, for us to be eternal and to be in his presence without shame. See. So when I discovered the church, it was easy. And then um then I, I believed it and I was baptized. Oh, I could tell you stories about what I went through. Oh gosh. There was so much that so many pitfalls, uh, so many people gave me horrible advice. And for some reason, I didn't follow it. <clears throat> it has something to do with being Irish and stubborn, I think. But I was really fortunate. I was given some terrible advice, terrible advice. And uh, but God protected me. And um, the idea of original sin is that, well, there was an original sin. There was a first. And what that did was that that basically uh made humanity incompetent. It would be the same as like if we had some sort of disaster movie or something where where um, I think there's some some movie, I don't remember what it's called, uh, there's, a, there's a cure for cancer that cures all the world of cancer and they spread it through the water and everything and everybody's cured of cancer. And six months later, you know, people become zombified basically because there's a virus that, that spreads to everyone genetically now everybody is genetically messed up and everything like that and um you can think of it like that we have like it's like like a, a gene that's passed on that we have the propensity to sin everybody does anybody who has a baby realizes that they're a sinner by the time they get to about one year old right they're an angel until then and then you know they're no longer like that they sin they like the Lord, no, they throw temper tantrums. All the rest, every baby does it just about. As far as I know, I mean, I've never seen a baby that doesn't. One, uh, one of the metaphors that we had sort of come to a conclusion on, uh, differentiating Catholic and Protestant original sin with Orthodox ancestral sin, um, uh, so if when people are born and they have the propensity to sin, it's sort of like having a tourniquet on your finger that's loose right now. It's just on. Every time you sin, you tighten that tourniquet and eventually your finger will die off. Right. And so um, with Catholic and Protestant original sin, 
every human being is not just born with the tourniquet on, but tightened. It's uh, one way of looking at it. But yeah. uh, in orthodox manner, not every human being by default has to sin. Uh, it, it's not it's not inevitable. They're very they're they're they have a propensity to, and all of them do. Uh, or you know, except possibly the felt ones. Except ones. But we won't comment on them. <laughs> the Bible says all have sinned. That's true. That's true. That's true. It does say that. It does say that. But there's a lot of yeah. is that uh, God also says if you don't hate your mother and your father, you won't be say, you won't worry, be worthy of me. You know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the scriptures, and we have to be careful that uh, that you know if, if we take one text and and focus on it, we can we can lose our way. But to complete the thought about original sin. For an Orthodox Christian, we've been infected with sin, with the propensity to sin, with the weakness towards sin, but not guilt. Not guilt. We're not born guilty. What a bizarre idea. That we're born guilty, but we're born with the likelihood of becoming guilty. Whereas the Roman, the Latin idea, because they were just sitting around thinking all the time and, you know, figuring out how many angels could be on the head of a pin and all that kind of stuff. And they... They were very, you know, rationalistic, came out of a feudal society, et cetera, et cetera. And so they came up with the idea that there is, everyone's guilty. Everyone's born guilty, right? And some people say that, some people would believe that the guilt was transmitted through sexual intercourse, which means there's no way to not be guilty. That's the only way babies are born, right? And what a terrible idea. And then you got the Theotokos. Well, if the Theotokos is born out of sexual intercourse, which nobody says she wasn't, right? Then that's guilty. She's guilty. Well, we can't have her be guilty because then Christ is guilty. We can't have Christ being born guilty of sin. He's, he's going to deliver us from sin. So you've got to have the Immaculate Conception to make her not guilty so that Christ is born not guilty. Well, we'd say, yeah, the Theotokos was not was born without sin, without guilt, because everybody's born without guilt, including Jesus. So there was one heresy, this idea of, of everyone's born guilty, everyone's guilty of sin. And then you have to have another one to undo that so that Jesus can be born not guilty. And we just say all of it's just malarkey. We're born with a propensity to sin with a weakness. We can see the weakness of human flesh. It's, it's pretty easy to see. And uh, some people are better than others. I mean, all of us have known people that are like, never cuss, never get angry. How do those people do that? They just don't. I've known unbelievers that don't cuss and don't get angry. Ever. How does that happen? You know, it can't. It's possible. But it's not very probable. So the, the Romans come up with all these things, you know. One of the things I, I remember somebody once told me, if you're a liar, you have to have a great memory. Because to tell one lie, you got to tell another and another and another. If you, if you don't have a good memory, just tell the truth. Because you don't have to come up with any, any stuff. You just tell the truth. That's it. So we just told the truth. We are born with a propensity to sin, but not immediately guilty of sin. That's it. So... So what other things we want to talk about? Um, in the prayer songs, there was a phrase used over and over that made me wonder, um, from age to age, or ages to ages, something like that. Is that a reference to dispensationalism? No, no. What, is, what, what, what ages are we talking about? Like eternity. From... Okay, this current age. Like, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Not like different dispensations, but now and ever and forever. Now and ever and unto the ages of ages, just a just a figure of speech meaning to eternity. It doesn't, there's nothing dispensational. Okay. I mean, the Father's what they go, dispensational? What are you talking about? It's in 19th century. Yeah, so that's all. Jews weren't thinking of dispensationalism. 
Yeah, all that dispensational stuff, like from Schofield and all those people, that's all very new. That's all 200 years old. Fathers didn't know anything about this stuff. So it's just a figure of speech, you know? Okay. You know, it's just a figure of speech. But we use it a lot, you're right. But because, you know, we talk about, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and ever and under the ages of ages. And that's actually, there is, there's a Hebraicism right there uh, where you have a couplet. Now and ever, that, that's enough. And under the ages of ages, it's just saying the same thing twice. Okay. That's all over Hebrew poetry. In the Psalms, it's everywhere. In the New Testament, it's everywhere. In our prayers, it's everywhere. That kind of saying something twice or saying something and then something that's slightly different. And mercy me, O God, according to thy great mercy and according to the multitude of thy compassions, blood of my transgression. We're saying the same thing twice. Yeah. Right? So that, that's all over Hebrew poetry, all over it. And therefore, it's all over Christian poetry. Because Christian poetry came out of Hebrew poetry. And some things you say identically three times, ten times, thirty-six times, whatever. Um, what is the purpose of, of that repetition? Well, three times is always reminding us of the Trinity. Uh, twelve times, well, there were twelve apostles. Uh, forty times, forty is used all over. In, this, in the scriptures, there's a lot of 40 time intermittent uh, periods. Jesus fasted for 40 days. Moses, Moses was on the mountain for 40 days. There was 40 days before the ascension. Uh, Noah's Ark. You know, there's so 40 is just an important number for that reason. My favorite number is 150 and 3 myself. 153? 153. Because when, when Jesus appeared to the, the disciples, they were fishing. He says, Brother. Children, you have any meat? Oh, you don't. You haven't caught any fish. Cast your net on the right side. He said the right side before he just said, "Cast your net, and you shall find." And there was 150 and three fish in the in the uh, in the net. And Peter girt his fisher's cloak about him, for he was naked, and he thrust himself into the sea, which is I think so. He gets to Christ as soon as possible. Then he drags the net full of fish, which was physically impossible. That many fish. He drags and and a hundred and fifty and three and though the net was though there was so many that yet the net was not broken. I mean, I just I've always liked that number because it's so indicative that when they caught the first catch of fish, they were completely overwhelmed. Their their ships began to sink. They were terrified. Peter says, "Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man." Now here he is swimming to Jesus as fast as he could. And then Jesus, of course, had the dialogue with him where he restored his apostolic ministry. Because Peter's thinking, I'm not worthy of the ministry. I've denied him. Right? And of course, Jesus emphatically showed him, no, no, you're, you're going to feed my sheep. You're going to feed my lambs. You know? So, very, very beautiful. So that's my favorite number. But we use three because of the Trinity. I think 12, well, the 12 patriarchs, the 12 apostles. And uh, 40, because it's just all over Scripture. You know, no 36. Okay. I, I lost count. <laughs> it's okay. What do you think I do? On my we don't do anything 490 times. Since that's just an arbitrary large number, seven times, uh, seven Jeez. times, seven times 70. 70 more times. Uh, I, I, I cracked the joke one time in catechism, and you read me there for a few months afterwards, but... When you're talking about that for forgiveness, it's more about forgiveness all the time. It's yeah. never, it's not. I probably I, did something smart enough. I said, you know, that's the 490th time I've had to ignore you. The next one, I'm getting. Oh, yeah, you said that to church. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You get 490 freebies. And after that, sure. I'm going to, the hammer's coming. The first, the four, the four, the hammer's coming down after 490, straight to the gulag. Do <laughs> not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. You're done. That's right. Four hundred ninety. Of course, it's just nice. Of course, it's just an arbitrarily large number. Of course, it's not four hundred ninety. But uh, so that's why we use those numbers. Um, there's no magic in them or anything. But we just, um, you know, we like to pray in a trinitarian way. Maybe if you were zoning out for the first, you know, thirty nine. 
at least you pay attention for the 40th, Lord have mercy, you know? Yeah. Or if you get the first one, someone else can get the other 39. You know, the repetition bothered me in the beginning um, when I was learning it because, you know, I just thought, why are we saying these things over and over again? And I started to learn that, well, we're not really very good at praying and we really need to uh, learn to be quiet ourselves. And um, just having a short little I just prayer, that's what I call the prayers that we had when I was a Protestant, you know, oh Lord, I just thank you for this and that. And I don't know, sometimes some people would pray for two minutes and that was awesome. Some people would take it like 20 minutes. It was like, what are they going to say next? And it was always just very shallow. It wasn't theological. And our prayer is super theological and super dense and super compunctionate and and it reminds us through numbers and things like that uh, of the Trinity and of the patriarchs and the apostles and all these things. So it's just it's just much more full for me and uh, so much so much better. I, I just hated the uh, extemporaneous prayer. That was the only thing we had in, in our gatherings was extemporaneous prayer. Maybe somebody said the Our Father. Maybe we'd say the Our Father. But that was it. That was the only, you know, written down prayer we'd say. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'd hear things like, wait a minute, they just said something that's heretical. It's like, everybody's just still sitting here. You know, because when people are making up prayers, you don't know what they're going to say. If you get someone to talk for long enough, they slip into heresy no matter what. It's, it's, you got to be careful. You got to be careful. Is the phone not telling anything, saying it's, it's still going on fine? Okay. Still cruising. Yeah. Okay, so any other questions? I hope I semi sense flying into your answers. You know, but the church is, is just amazing. Uh, when I came I, to the church, I just felt like a, a man had been in the desert forever, you know, and it was the first cool water that I'd had in weeks. It's just amazing, you know, and I've never lost that feeling that, uh, that that the truth that I felt uh, when I first really said, this is true. And I'm going to become Orthodox no matter what. My Roman Catholic mother thinks I'm insane. Well, it's okay. I'm going to do it because I was 20 years old, you know. I was, I'm going to charge ahead. Not everybody does that. Some people, you know, some people, they, they kind of put their foot in a little bit and they, et cetera. They kind of feel it out. Everybody's different. But me, I was just going to charge ahead. That's it. And so I did. And I never regretted one nanosecond of it. One of the things that having been the charismatic, it taught me was to hunger for God's presence. And it was in orthodoxy that I got way more than I expected to get. Yeah. You know? The thing that I've learned from Orthodoxy, I think more than anything else when I from being a Protestant was the sense of how big God is and how small we are and how little we love him and yet he loves us and how that the problem really is is me, is my impurities and my ignorance and my stupidity and my bad agendas and all the rest. And, uh, but God loves us. He's going to help us. Um, I love our prayer. It's continually saying, I'm a terrible sinner, basically. But you're going to help me. All of our prayers just about are like that. It's all over. Even the Our Father is like that, but it doesn't really get interpreted like that, except in an Orthodox context. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Well, why are we forgiving our... Why are we asking our debts to be forgiven or our sins or our trespasses? Because we're terrible people. But God loves us. But we better forgive others because we're terrible people, right? We better be like the, the person um, who is forgiven the debt but doesn't go out and throttle someone who has a lesser debt, right? What a terrible thing to forget who we are, to look in a mirror and then forget who we are and we walk away from the mirror. And Orthodox, we're always aware of uh, of our sinfulness uh, at least in the in the in the 
church's pronima or the church's mind. Now, individually, we're often not very aware of our sins. You know, we're kind of full of ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, there's a real mindset uh, that we're sinners and that God's going to help us. And uh, I never had that mindset as a Protestant. It just didn't, just, I mean, there was a kind of idea. Yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're growing. God's not diff- finished with me yet, kind of stuff like that. But it, it wasn't, it wasn't something that was just, that I, that was just fundamentally resonating in me. It didn't really resonate until it became an Orthodox Christian. And it's very free. It's just so wonderful to say, hey, I'm a bad guy, but I'm becoming a better guy. I just like that better. Because it's true. I know I'm a bad guy. You know? Yeah. It's hard to find a purpose to life in Protestantism besides evangelism. For me, it was, yeah. Once you've prayed the prayer, Besides evangelism, you know, yeah. you're 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 all good. You've got the insurance. I, I didn't like the evangelism because it was like, okay, well, what what next after that? Because I'm telling more people think I start I stopped believing that. You know, yeah. I wanted to, uh, and I I was oh my gosh, I was a uh, I was on a little house in a uh, big house actually in Cape May in uh, Cape May Courthouse, New Jersey. No, no, that's where I worked. There was a place in New Jersey we stayed, and we know Wildwood, New Jersey, and it's a resort town. And so uh, we would preach on the beaches at night, and we'd sing our songs and such, and then we'd work. I was there for two months doing a theological. There was like 40 of us. And um, I was asking the guy who was mentoring me. His name was Jim Dunn. I wonder if he's still alive, you know, because he would have been 20 years, easily 20 years older than me. And uh, so I'm asking him, Jim, why don't you ask, I ask you to pray for me, right? Yeah, I, yeah. And you, and you, and I pray for you, right? Yeah, we should, you know? Well, why don't we ask St. Paul to pray for us? And Jim is like, what? Why don't we ask Athel Tokas to pray for us? It says, she says that all generations will call me blessed and yet we, we place no emphasis on her at all. It's like, well, my given name is Tim. Tim, you know, you just you're losing your way here. You know, they 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 were worried that I was backsliding. It was it was horrendous the last two weeks. Oh gosh, because I didn't want to do any of the stuff anymore. You know, but I was still committed. I still had plane to catch later and to go back home and everything. It was it was really it was a hard difficult time because they were convinced that I was backsliding, and I'm going. <sighs> What do we have except we all believe in Jesus and we don't even believe what that is? You know, there's a Christian singer named Larry Norman. He actually turned out not too well, I think. But at the time, he was uh, uh, very popular. I was listening to Larry Norman and Petra and second chapter of Acts and that's all we're playing at all the time. Phonograph, you know. Do you guys actually know what that is now? Because vinyl's a big deal, right? I mean, nobody knows what an A-track is. But vinyl, everybody knows vinyl. Everybody knows. But um, we must be about the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I hated that track. I even wanted a cassette. But uh, but anyway, uh, we always listen to that. And Larry Norman is just. He was just. Uh, I remember there was a song, you know, drinking whiskey from a paper cup or something. You know, can't stand up. Why don't you look into Jesus? He's got the answer. And of course, it was really hard rock, and we all love that. And, you know, I just, at some point, I thought, what are we doing here? All it is 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 shallow descriptions, you know? If we look into Jesus, why don't we look into him? What did the Father say about him? <laughs> there, you want to look into him? Read the creed, you know? There we go. There's a beginning. But we didn't have any of that. We just had believe in Jesus. That's it. Believe in Jesus. And I love those people, and there was a lot of beautiful experiences. But when I started to ask them questions and say, "Well, why, why don't, why do we have all these differences? Somebody believes in baptism, another doesn't. Well, that doesn't matter. What matters is we believe in the Lord." Okay, what if the Lord says, "Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit," but you don't do it? 
The, is that believing in the Lord? It's right there in Matthew. You know? And I remember going to a place called the Upper Room. Can you imagine what they did? You know? Because they're, they're, did. they're just the pulling room. their hands up and tweeting like birds and stuff. And I remember the first time I went there, and they're singing, maybe not the first time, but we're singing all these nondescript praise songs, which are just, you know, they, they sound nice, but they, they don't, they all say the same thing. And then at the end of the song, all of a sudden I hear birds tweeting. I mean, it sounded like I was in an apiary. It's like, oh, that's beautiful. But I didn't know what it was. So then I go to the worship leader, whatever he is, afterwards. And I say, what happened there? He says, oh, we were singing in tongues. So I'm saying, I didn't hear anybody interpret. Well, what are we singing in tongues for if there's no interpretation? And it, it, we're not supposed to do that according to the scriptures, right? And he says, oh, our experiences tells us that this is blessed by God. I, oh, I got it. So you like to sing in tongues because it, it, it's cool. And, and, and your experience tells you. But this guy's experience, he, that's not right. His experience that this is the Eucharist, that can't be right. Or his experience that that we call her the mother of God or whatever, because my experience is the definition of what is the church. I'm thinking, okay. And that was the beginning of, uh, of the end. I think I, I saw an Orthodox church for the first time shortly after that. It, it was done. I was done. I was going to be Orthodox. Why is uh, St. Hermione being highlighted today? <laughs> That's a little bit of a joke right there. So he's pointing something to her. about a birthday or something. He's trying to point to her. Yeah, the last couple of times we've come in here, we brought basically all of the various icons that we have, all the various saints that Hermione and I appreciate with a, a great deal. And yeah, but there's not forty of them, so there's something uncanonical about this. <laughs> yeah, you only have thirty. You only have thirty-seven, and that's not right. And some of them are duplicates, so I don't even know. Check it. <laughs> <laughs> so thirty-seven is not a canonical number. Slightly on the wrist, then. <laughs> Either forty or or twelve or one hundred fifty-three. You can do one hundred fifty-three if you. Well, four hundred ninety. Four hundred ninety. Yeah, you can do four hundred. How's the how's those printouts look? Would those be? Another 400 of those look good? No. Never. <laughs> All right. Should we, should we, and it's 2115. Mm -hmm. I can go on. My phone probably can't, but yeah. yep. run out of energy. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. God bless you. I'm going to try to come every month. So um, next January, theoretically. Every third Monday. Every third Monday. This one is an anomaly. This is an anomaly because this next third Monday, next week, is um, our feast day for our Saint, Saint Nicholas is um, on Tuesday. So we have a feast, uh, uh, you know, a big service uh, the night before and a, and a big service um, that morning. We're going to have 20 people coming from Arkansas and they're going to stay in the hall. They're just going to get... You know, you crash there with sleeping bags and whatever. So we're going to have to try to figure out how to provide them some food, maybe make a big stew or something. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, 20 people coming from there. I always go up there for uh, the feast day of the, the parish up there in the North Little Rock. But, I mean, that's just like two or three of us. They're bringing 20. Crazy, isn't it? All right. God bless you.